Hello everyone. Um, my name's Dan, uh, for those that don't know me. Um, I'm originally from Perth, Western Australia. Um, it was a long, long time ago when uh, well, my parents had always been going to churches, uh, different groups, uh, uh, trying to find the truth, I guess. Um, and they come across revival at, uh, um, when I was about six or seven. Um, that's where I first heard about the, the gospel and I was only young, but still, even though you're young, you still uh, um, hear about it and you, and, and you do need to follow. Uh, so I followed, um, I repented, got baptised um, under full immersion of water, and then I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues. Uh, that was when I was nine, a few years ago <laughs> now. Um, but the Lord's blessed me. Um, I won't go through everything, but I will I, I mention um, when I was in my mid to late teens, I uh, started to develop uh, what I called social anxiety. I didn't know it was an actual thing, but um, I, that's what I called it. I couldn't talk to people. Um, it was like this gripping fear that would to, like, get me. Um, and uh, I remember when I was young, just looking at everyone else, thinking, why can't I do that? Why can't I just talk to people? Why can't I just be with people? Um, and someone else had something similar, and they, how they described it was, was really good. It's like you're outside of a house. Everyone's inside of the house. You can see them but you don't know how to get in and you don't know how to be there kind of thing and that's kind of how it felt, it was like this barrier I was there and uh, when I was heading towards my late teens I, um, uh, I sat myself down I guess, I think I got down, where are you going, um, what are you doing, so I started talking to myself, <laughs> but um, uh, I, 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 I realised I hadn't really given God a go and I haven't really um, uh, I put, put what I was going through to the Lord, I heard a, t- a talk from Pastor Kevin Quirk um, uh, about different healings, and he mentioned social healing. Uh, um, and I thought, ah, oh, I can pray about this, you know, and I, I can get a victory for it. And so I started, uh, so I prayed about it, um, and it was really quick when it happened. Um, it was uh, like that gripping fear that I had just left me, and it was like this revelation, you know, that you know, I didn't need to fear, I didn't need to have those worries, I didn't need to have that uh, 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 what was hanging over me kind of thing. And it, um, it was it kind of um, uh, impacted all parts of my life. You know, it doesn't matter what it was. You know, um, with the Lord, uh, with uh, uh, our work at the time, with everything, it kind of impacted everything. I couldn't really do anything much um, uh, outside the simple things. There, um, I realised I was able to talk to talk to people after that, and um, it wasn't until I can't remember how long it was, like a couple of months or so, um, I, um, I had to give a testimony in front of the Perth Convention, the first one. And there's no way I could have done that. I mean, doing this, I couldn't have done. Um, and uh, that was a, a big miracle for me, uh, knowing that I could do that. I could go up and stand and, and talk to people. And, uh, you know, every now and you get that fear. Every now and then, it's sort of like a natural thing everyone gets. But, you know, what I had back then, you know, was, was completely taken away from me. And um, as Paddy would say, you can't shut me up now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, it's good. It's good having that, that miracle and knowing that I can stand up and talk to people and knowing that I don't have that barrier, you know, I, I found the door, I can get in and I talk to people and that, uh, yeah, that was a big miracle. Amen. 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 <laughs> 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 I've a walk around the, the building, I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What we're going to do this evening is, is we'll have it, just as we've heard um, from Dan, we're going to have uh, three short testimonies and three short talks. Very short for me, ten minutes, supposedly. Let's <laughs> see what we can do. So if you want to take out your Bibles, if you have them, you've probably seen uh, the leaflet that we've been given out is Come and Hear How God Can Undo Your Heavy Burdens. And there's a picture of over a guy's head of, you know, lots of, let's say, uh, dark things or heavy things that are in his mind. Uh, some of those things can be described as hopelessness or loneliness or anxiety, etc. And back in Isaiah chapter 1, we see that this kind of thing has always been there for mankind. And... Um, it's God's uh, intention, as always, to, to undo the heaviness, to, to get rid of the oppression, and to bring liberty to people. And he does that through his Holy Spirit. And in Isaiah, he's, he's looking at his own country, and maybe we can look a bit at the world 
But w when we see, look out at the world, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see what's happening in the world. And he uses very similar language to what's in Matthew. I want to watch the time. In uh, verse 2 it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He uses a little farming example, because we're in Kerry. <laughs> uh, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crew. What Israel do and not know my people do, they not consider. And you can put any nation in there instead of Israel. And it's still the same. A sinful nation, a people laden with inequity. And laden means to be to be weighed down, that it's it's stopping you moving. That could be anything. That could be maybe you've had tragedy in your life, maybe you've suffered from social anxiety, whatever it is, maybe your financial burdens, whatever it is. And human beings can get laden down with anything. One of the main things is, is is inequity, and he's saying a seed, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors, and the reason is, is they've forsaken the Lord, they've provoked the Holy One of Israel onto anger, and they're gone backwards, and it's almost like the Lord is like the doctor, and he's given a, a diagnosis on the world, and he's saying, why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in us but wounds and bruises and purifying or putrefying source they have not been closed neither bound up nor mollified with ointment and he, he's the lord's just describing like a doctor how how the world is sick of course he has the remedy your country is desolate your cities are burnt with fire and strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in the garden of cucumbers, a besieged city. And if you go around Kerry, you'll see there's a lot of empty, sometimes cottages and stuff. And that, that's almost like the way the world has become at the moment. And, and the biggest point, of, we'll, we'll see the solution in a bit. I want to show a video from 1965, which is almost like a prophecy. Um, Dan's gonna get that up uh, for a sec. In, in, uh, while he's getting that before he plays it. In, it, no need to go there, well, I'll quote it. In Revelation 17, bringing it up to our own time, if you like, it talks about Babylon, and it's, it describes her as the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. And uh, I know the first part of this is going to sound a bit dark, but it's just to show you where we're stuck at the minute and where we have to go. Because sometimes if you don't see where you are, sometimes when you're in the darkness, you, you, you've missed the light. If you ever, you know, go out into the darkness, initially if somebody dropped you into it, you, you can't see. But after a while, you become accustomed to the darkness and you start to, to live in that and you think that's the only way that's, that's available. And there's another de description in the Bible that says the sins of the fathers. And we, we have an opposition to God. And that's what he attacks. Is actually, if you look at Western civilization, the attack has been on the father. Because if you bring the father down, you bring the traditional family down. And the traditional family goes, the economy and, and, and the economics and the society as a whole will struggle. And we're, we're actually seeing that, the fabric of society. This is interest. This from a, yeah, go on, play If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. 
And the old I would teach to pray after me, Our Father, which art in Washington. <laughs> and then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies, and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, I'd have judges promoting pornography, Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Yeah, I think that's the end of that. I wasn't expecting Dan to subscribe to that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, an interesting look. That's from 1965. I think that our stuff has come to pass very much in, in our system. Did you know that seven is the magic number for guitar? Sorry. Seven it's notes, okay. seven. seven chords, <laughs> seven feelings, um, and seven strings. There we go. Just in case you wanted to know, seven is God's number, by the way. I mentioned about uh, the harlot. That actually, that, that comes from the word one. It's an enticer. And you see that. You see our society is, 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 is under great stress. I, I, I have great admiration for young people trying to get through this society at the moment. I wouldn't like to be a young person growing up, so hallelujah to, to the young people. But if we just go to, back to Isaiah for a second, uh, in chapter 1, the, the rest of this. So, so the Lord in, in, in Matthew talks about, take upon my yoke. And, uh, you know, really, really the Lord wants to be the heavy lifter in your life. Now, um, Jesus Christ went to the cross and showed us the power of vulnerability. He showed us courage in, in going to the cross and making himself uh, weak so that people could actually become strong by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, courage actually comes from the Latin to tell the story from the heart. And he has compassion uh, initially, you know, when he, get, when he fills you with the spirit, it, it's on yourself and then it's on others. And we're not afraid to be corrected. And, and the fact is, is he, when you get filled with the spirit, he can make you be you. You don't have to be, the world is full of fakes. We live in the Western world, which elevates actors and actresses and that's what it's all about is that kind of thing but the lord wants to take us out of that darkness and bringing us into the light and in isaiah chapter 1 in verse 16 it says wash you and make you clean put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes and cease to do evil 
learn to do well, seek judgment or justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And he's really given an invitation. He's saying, you know, and it, 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 this invitation, we're giving out invitations now, but they're actually coming from God. And he's inviting people into a place where they can actually be uh, free. And you can actually be yourself because he fills you with the spirit. You don't have to pretend anymore saying that today when we're giving out an invitation. There's no way I could preach the gospel because I'd be too afraid of what people taught me. But now because you've the spirit, you've been uh, liberated. Just like at the end of World War II, there was great darkness over Europe. There was little lights of pockets of resistance. And eventually D-Day came. And it was called, uh, it was like, they were called the liberators. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. It's a, it's a liberator. And what you have to do initially is, is obviously get baptized the same way as Jesus. That's what it's saying. Wash you, make you clean. You know, if you were in no man's land in World War II, if you didn't put up your hands, you'd, be, you'd go down from either side. But once you put your hands up and you say to the Lord, Lord, I actually can't carry this anymore. And I need you to carry it. And once you get, you, you admit that, the Lord can move in with the Spirit. And he goes on to verse 18, he says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your skin, sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. You've seen the mountains around uh, Tralee today. And how beautiful the snow can make the ugliest looking thing look beautiful. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You can't see it in each other you know but from the lord's perspective when he fills us with the spirit and brings us into that place of light uh that's what he that's what he sees is this just this beautiful uh people that are white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool if you be willing and obedient you shall eat the good of the land but if you refuse and rebel it will have a problem and last thing maybe the quote is is if you think, you know, before I came to the Lord, in Ephesians 5 verse 8, it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, and walk as children of the light. Now, you could play on the word light. You know, light allows you to see, but on the other side, light can be something that's light. You become light. You're not weighed down. The, the brokenhearted are set free. The... the, the people with anxiety, it's, it's lifted off them, etc. And that's what the Lord is offering, is this invite for people to take up that they don't have to be in bondage. I'm just going to show you one little Dublin thing, which takes seven seconds. I just want you to think, in the gym today, I seen, this is a picture of Paddy and Dan when they were in the gym. And sometimes what happens? <laughs> 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 what? What? You have to... Brad. <laughs> the reason I wanted to show that is <laughs> so that was that was Paddy and Dan earlier. And sometimes that's what the world is like. It's trying to lift everything. Individuals are trying to lift everything. So in the gym that's called spotting. Somebody goes around to help you lift it up. That's what the Lord wants to do for people. Is lift it off. Hopefully better than Paddy and Dan. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. Next Tony. up is Tony for a little testimony. Followed by Pastor Mark. Uh, no, Dan. Oh, Dan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi folks. Yes, um, I can certainly praise the Lord for my salvation. But, uh, as I walked on with the Lord, I, like everybody, you have your situations where you, you call out to the Lord. And at this particular time, I was just 2005, I think, or just before I was due to retire. And I, had, uh, I was sitting in the, the restroom with some of the guys and one of the fellows said, what's that on the side of your face then? I said, oh, I just had a bit of a pimple or something, you know. 
and he said, oh. and then he said, uh, well, keep an eye on it. He was just the first day to us all, yeah. And at a point we were in the, in the same place having something to eat, and he came in and he, I said, and he looked at me and he said, do you know that's gone right across your face here? Doctor, now. I said, oh, all right, fair enough. So uh, I went to the doctors and uh, the next day and uh, Sandra was with me and he said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Allen, but you've got done Hodgkin's and lymphoma. And I said, what's that then? <laughs> <laughs> and Sandra said, it's cancer. I said, he said, don't mind, we'll get you in tomorrow. <coughs> and I was in there the next day and uh, they looked at it and they said, we'll take a sample of it and just check it out first. They did that and they, I went back a couple of days later and they said, it's a necrotic. I said, what's that mean? I've learned a lot in <laughs> surgery. Necrotic, that means that the cells are dead. And he, she said to me, she was one of the surgeons, she says, but don't worry, we'll take it out and we'll go from there. And uh, it's, anyway, they took the whole lot out in the end, you know, because it was going right across the face sort of thing. Spoiling my looks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no comment. <laughs> anyway, uh, they called me in a couple of weeks later after I had an operation and uh, they were going to tell me what's what. And they were, it's necrotic. The whole thing is necrotic. And I said, well, that's odd. You know, I've never heard of that before. And there were, there were about five or six students there as well. And the two surgeons were there. And they, started, they sat me in the middle of the room. I thought like I was on question time or something. Like that. <laughs> on my own, sitting there, Sandra was over on the back. And uh, they said, Well, Mr. Allen, we're, good. we're not, it is necrotic. We quite, can't quite understand it, but we're going to, you know, we're going to look into it a bit more. We'd like you to have chemo, 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 whatever it's called. And I said, No, no way. And I said, Why? I said, Well, my dad had cancer. And the chemo killed him quicker than the cancer. So I said, no way. They said, well, we'll come to a compromise where we're, what we'll do is we'll get you to go and visit the consultant every six months or so, and he can check you out. And I said, well, let's not be silly. You know, I'll do that, fair enough. But prior to that, as we were going out, they said, I said, well, have you come up with any clues as to what might be causing it? And they said, we don't know. And they're talking amongst themselves and debating and I said, excuse me, excuse me. And they said, what? I said, do you think there might have been a third person involved? They went, eh? and They were looking at me and I went, mm -hmm. and there, oh, yeah, because I'd already witnessed to one of the surgeons when I first went there, you know. And anyway, they said, what we want you to do is come and see us every three or six months. And it got to, I was, be waiting in the waiting room after I've been there a couple of times and there'd be people in the waiting room to see this boat the same thing and you could see they were stuck in there going through the you know, terrible times and they're looking at me saying what's wrong with you and I'm going I thought I'm not going to tell them I'll leave it and uh, I went in there and I said to him he said oh, well, I'll just come back every 18 months or something just to keep things he said that's fine yeah. and I had to do that for five years and when I went in the last time, he calls me and he says, Tony, Tony, come in. I said, oh, we were all first night in Clinton. He says, oh, I'm happy to say that it's all clear. There's nothing. You, you're clear, mate. You can go home. And, and then he said, but you knew that already, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'd witnessed to him in different stages of, of the five years. Hopefully he might uh, uh, it might have made him prompt to say, well, hang on, there might be something in what that guy's saying, you know. He might be Irish, but he might be something in it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, first of all. Amen. 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 <laughs> so, let's talk tonight. Uh, it's a little thought, actually. There was a... Um, a couple of weeks ago, well, actually, a couple of months ago, I was, um, I was uh, on my way home from work. Everybody knows the story already. I was on my way home from work, and um, me and Scott went to bed. 
M20. Uh, we're pulling down the road, and it was a bit of a traffic jam on the M20. Anyway, I was um, queuing up to get past this what looked like a bit of a truck and a train and a lorry kind of accident sort of thing. It was just down to two lanes, so we're slowly making our way past and um, got sort of like just up, up close to this vehicle. And I could see there was a trailer, like a van, and a lorry. And this, this van had gone into the back of this, this lorry. And in the back, there um, was livestock, apparently. Anyway, so just about to get past this fella. And he jumped out in front of my van and said, Help, help me get the people, the other people. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> that's what I'm help me get me, um, my, my truck and trailer part because I've got sheep in the back. Yeah? And so um, pulled over and and there's sort of a few bits of smoke coming out the front of this, uh, this van sort of thing. And so I pulled over and opened the back up and we went around to try and dislodge this trail off the back of this van. So there's me and there's Scott and this fellow who's driving the, the van kind of yanking on this trailer, you know, on the tow bar to try and dislodge it from the back of the, 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 the van, yeah? Anyway, um, he looked around and he said, oh, it's on fire. The van's on fire, you know? So I said, okay, Scott, go back and get a crowbar out of the van, get the tools and all that sort of stuff. So there is, now there's flames coming out in front of this van and there's sheep in the back and you're in the middle trying to dislodge this thing, you know, trying to save these sheep. And um, it's getting quite tense by then. Because you know? you're, you're between the van and the, you know, the, the, the trailer, you don't know what's going on. The kind of anxiety's building up sort of thing. And you have to look around the corner and then Scott's walking back with, with a crowbar and all of a sudden the van went, <laughs> And then big flames coming out in front of the van. And I looked and I was like, oh, oh, this is scary. You know, this is scary. Mm -hmm. Bunch of panicking, bit, bit stressful sort of thing. And so I was like, right, everybody, get around to the trailer. So we went to the back of the trailer, pushed the trailer, pulled the bar down and empty, like pulled down the kind of like flaps of the trailer. And then these like little group of sheep all kind of like, <laughs> they were huddled together, you know, because they're sort of scared because they've just been obviously crashed and, and so me and Scott, we just jumped into the back of this trailer, grabbed a sheep, washed a lamb, I had a lamb under this arm, and then, then a few people got out of their cars or whatever, I was like chucking his lambs out the back of the van, you know, back of the trailer, <laughs> and we were all walking down the side of the road with lambs on the our arms. I feel like complete heroes, really, you know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, and um, I don't know where lambs are now, they put it in a, like a stick or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> lamb kebab, sort of thing. <laughs> but anyway, at the time, they were so cute and cutting. And um, what it made me think of was this, this scripture, because I've always kind of pondered upon this, uh, this little scripture here. Um, in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. So the Lord teaches us to be conquerors, isn't he? The Lord teaches us that um, he will fight for us, but also he teaches us how to fight for ourselves as well. You know, some, reason, some, some cases he will just clear things out of our way, in other cases, he will teach us how to fight. And that's what he used to do with Israel as well. In some, some of the lands, he completely pushed out the inhabitants. But in some of the lands, he left the inhabitants in there. So Israel will be taught the art of war. It's very important for us to realise that for ourselves as well. The Lord will teach us how to fight as well as he will fight for us. It says there in um, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So my experience was, I didn't even know these sh well, sheep, who knows sheep, but these sheep weren't my sheep. But I had a feeling that I wanted to save these sheep, you know. They were just dear little lambs, you know, and they had, you know, no way of being saved. They were going to be stuck and they were going to be kebabs inside the trailer. There's no way they could escape, yeah? But I had this, I had this inside me, I just wanted to save these sheep, you know? And what it made me realise is the Lord is like that for us. He knows where mankind's heading. He knows where we are heading without the Lord, without him. And he has this urgency save us from what's to come and mankind and he wants people to be saved and so you know this is what it's saying here we are we are counted as sheep for the slaughter the lord knows our end if we don't follow him if we don't do what he says 
he knows what's happening. We're accounted for that. And that's actually from Psalm 44, that there. Um, and looking back on it, it is when Israel realised they were in a mess and they were calling out upon the Lord. That's Psalm 44, the distraction from there. And so that is the best place for us to be, isn't it? Before we come along, if we uh, look to the Lord and realise that we are a mess, we cannot be saved, we don't know what to do, and we have no, we have no way out. You know, we are like the sheep inside that little trailer. That is the best place for us to find salvation. But we know we can't, you know, we know we've got no strength for ourselves. We turn to the Lord fully, and um, the Lord is always there for us. And as, as I said, he will fight for us, but also he will teach us uh, to fight. Uh, just turn to John 16, just quickly. It's a really nice one, just expressing... Jesus talking about uh, the, Lord, the Lord's love for us. In verse 27... For the Lord, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I come out from God. And here we see this realisation, this thing for us to realise that the Lord loves us because we love Jesus Christ. When we're born again, when we, uh, when we walk in with the Lord, the Lord loves us. He really loves us. You know? He counts us in the same position that he will fight for us, but also he will teach us to fight as well. Now, I told this talk the buckler. Does anybody know what a buckler is? I asked around a few people what a buckler is. Anyone got an no idea? I think a few people, probably Pastor Mike knows what a buckler is, do you? No? Anybody know what a buckler is? It's not a sword. It's not a sword. Okay. A shield. I thought it was a belt. Shield. It's close. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it's a shield and buckler. All right, okay, let's read the scripture instead. Let's read that one. Uh, second, second Samuel 22. <clears throat> 22. <clears throat> All right, so second Samuel twenty two. And it's the last one, I don't know, last <laughs> 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 Verse 29, all right. Uh, for thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. Think about this, this sort of like the heading for this little time we're having together. For by thee have I run through a troop, by my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect, the word of the Lord is tried, he is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So there we have the thought about darkness lightning things running instead of you know struggling and leaping over walls and realizing that god's way is perfect and he is a buckler to all those that trust in him and the buckler is you see that yeah yeah that is a buckler all right so in other scriptures we can read the lord is our shield and buckler now a shield is something that is quite a large rounded thing that the Romans have used to use it and it would be for a full frontal attack and if there's an army coming against you what you do is you put your shield down sometimes you dig it in the floor and you just get down behind it and you let the arrows or whatever or the spears just hit the shield and you can protect it sometimes in life we use a shield it's just get down behind your shield and get your protection from the Lord and you know the Lord is there for that but on the other hand, sometimes the Lord instructs us to be more skillful. And that's where the buckler comes into play. Uh, the Lord will teach us to use this thing, you know, in the way that we understand scripture. We know how to use the word of the Lord to uh, move, to protect ourselves. Because with a buckler, because it's like a, it's a small thing, it's more of a defensive, you know, and it's got a little spike on the bit. So, if you're being attacked by something, you can doink it on the head, you know? And sometimes it's as simple as that, you know? Things that are coming against us, we need to doink them on the head a little bit and be, you know, let the, the buckler, let the Lord teach us how to move in such a way and understand what's going on that we will put this thing, defence, in the right place. We know the scriptures to put the defence of what's coming against us in our minds, in the world, whatever it is, the Lord is going to be our buckler if we look to him and be taught by him and allow ourselves to be moved in a way that the defence is going to happen. 
Yeah. And so it's more and more of a hand-to-hand combat thing. You know, sometimes, you know, like I say, you will have a time where you just need to get down on a shield. But everyday life, we use the buckler. In witnessing even, you know, we're talking to people, uh, we are revealing God's plans, we are showing, you know, people come back with other bits and pieces, religions, you know, we can use the, uh, the scriptures in a way that we can almost attack, but defend as well. We can attack, but you know, that it says, talks about, uh, you know, fighting the fight, fighting the good fight, you know, with the gospel, but also defending the faith as well, you know. Wonderful thing that the Lord can do there for us. Um, more skin involved with that, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Overall, I suppose, really, just sort of finishing off, it's um, let the Bible influence your our actions. You know, as we feel when you know, if, as we feel that we do sometimes, you know, have attacks in our own minds, if you like, you know, doubts and you know, miscomings of ourselves. We can tell ourselves. We can use the defence that we have through the scriptures to 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 ward off those things that go on and lift us up, as we heard and. Make you able to run for a troop and leap over a wall and, and run and you know, fight the good fight. So always looking to the Lord and, and knowing that He He wants to fight for us, fight with us, show us how to fight. And as as you know, it's a description of the lambs to the slaughter. He feels He 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 wants to protect us. He wants to save us. You know, and so that that sort of sense I had of wanting to like get these lambs out of there. They really made me kind of understand that scripture of what the Lord is talking about there. He he knows the situation we're in. He knows that situation. He, he will get us out of those situations when we look to him. Just as Israel in Psalm 44, like a psalm of remembrance, a psalm of repentance, a psalm of like, we can't do this on our own, Lord, please help. That's what the description of that is in there. So, you know, as we do that, we find our peace and our joy and our uplifting and the oil of joy. And, you know, when things change for us, and we can praise the Lord for that. Amen. 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 Nice to see you now. Hello everyone, my name is Cecilia. Uh, I came to the Lord in 2010 when my sister Richesha left me. And at that time I have my, one of my sons, they are twins. But one of them is uh, autistic, and when I start coming to the Lord, it was so, so difficult to deal with him. And I remember one day, prayer and fast in the, the Tomo and Yana's house, and in the case, I said that we have art work there, and Yana told me, oh, you go and sit down, and we last. I said, no, he's just not good. He said, okay, and you just go and sit down with me to the top and everything. And then he starts. He did all the painting work that they did. And then he starts running obsessions, just mess up with the prayer and fast talk and everything. And then I said to me and uh, Tom had to just him because he's going upset. We don't know what she's going to do. It was, it was so, I cried. It was so hard. And then he keep this the same. This thing that he's, he was doing, he's doing it. He has he's going to special school at the time. And she's, he was doing it there in the house and everywhere he is. It's very noisy. And he's the one when I came in 2010 again, he doesn't have a speech, not a word, and he doesn't understand anything. So it was difficult to deal with him everywhere he is. And I keep praying and I keep trusting the Lord. And it got to very, very worse. And I tell myself, this will put me off from coming to the Lord. And then, uh, I don't know the day and the time, the Lord changed him and he became very, very calm and uh, and more understanding. 
So he can come to the fellowship and in the prayer time, I remember, he come to the prayer line and Pastor Anton will pray for him and go and sit down. And since then, the speech start coming. He starts speaking and that more understanding and very much situation that change. Uh, the Lord fixed it and I can deal it was bigger than me. Yeah, it was bigger than me. We tried a lot to help me in every situation. And since then that I'm talking today, I couldn't come because of the way he is. His dad doesn't want to mind him. And the Lord has changed things. And he gave me a hope and confidence that no matter what the situation is, he's there. And now the daycare is in daycare. The people that they mind him, they love him because he's calmer and more understanding. And he can also choose what he wants. He said it in the word. And also in, in, in the, if you know the way the meeting is on Wednesdays and Sundays, and he's helping me to get ready to the meeting. And now what we do, you know, I used to go to the YouTube after the meeting. So he want to listen. And I open him and say, church, church, church. I say, okay, <laughs> so I go to the YouTube and they still give me the, uh, all the list and so all the talk is coming one after the other and he will see whether he understand it or not he's listening and he listens to them and when he's tired uh, he turn off the tv and he go to bed it's just i can really see the joy and the peace that the lord has given me he's giving me a hope that all, all things are possible. Whereas well, it was impossible, the Lord make it possible for me. And here I am today, seeing all, all of you, brothers and sisters. I'm very, very happy to see you all. Amen. 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 Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, so um, just a quick look at. Um, so turn to Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six. It's in here. Um, been out on the out, um, outreaching today, and one of the questions you get asked a lot when you're when you're out there is, um, if there's a God, why does He let all the bad things happen in the world? You get asked that question a lot, then, mm -hmm. um, and it's good good to have an answer because um, what they're asking is they identify if there's a God, God should have power. And God should have um, the ability to change the way things are. So, so the question is quite specific. It's if there is a God, why does He allow all these bad things to happen? Because we know the world's full of bad things. And so, why does God allow it? And um, just as a, a way of introduction to this this verse, because this um, like three or four verses here give a very clear answer to the question needs a little bit of context first, is that this is the story of a guy called Zedekiah, um, who was the very last king um, of Judah. So um, I, like, I like doing my, my three minute history of the kings of Israel and Judah. So, um, so you have King Saul, um, and then King David and King Solomon, and that, um, we're all familiar with that. And then after King Solomon, it splits into two tribes, um, Judah and Israel. And it's quite sort of distinct um, in the, the line of the kings of Judah, they're all, uh, it's a bloodline, so it's father to son all the way through to, um, well, actually not quite father to son, sometimes there's some uncles involved, but, um, but it's a bloodline all the way through to, to Zedekiah. In the kings of Israel, um, there's different dynasties, if you like, and amongst the kings of Judah, there's some, some good ones, and mostly bad ones, but um, with Israel, they were pretty much all bad of, of the kings. Um, you just get, you know where you're going, Dennis? Okay, so this 
So, um, and so, so that's basically the base of the story. And we end up with Zedekiah, the last of the kings of kings of, um, of Judah, and everything's gone wrong. And um, and God sort of just summing summing up really what's happened because all this time you've got prophets coming along talking to the kings and talking to the to the nation and really trying to put things and um, put things right, but people are ignoring them. So, answer to the question: Why does God let allow bad things to happen? Is that um, we're taking thirty six verse. Um, 15, and um, it's just that this is just sort of summing up, he says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up the times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God had compassion on the people. He loved the people, um, and, and so because he loved the people, he, he sent messengers to try and put things right. Um, but this is what happened, verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God, and they despised his words, and they misused the prophets, his prophets, until the wrath of God rose against his people, until there was no remedy. There was, um, it got to a point where they were so, um, the people of the world were so resistant to, to God's message, to God's compassion, to God, what God was telling them to do to be right, that there was just no cure left in the end. They, their hearts were so hardened that there was no cure. There was no answer. And so what happened um, as a result of that, it says, therefore he, God, brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And because mankind ignores God and God's compassion and his love, which would have fixed the problem, God said, well, I'm going to put you in the hand. You don't want my compassion. I'm going to put you in the hands of your own kind, of the rulers of this world, who it says here have no compassion. And that's why the evil is on the world, because people have ignored God, um, who had compassion and love uh, and had a just way of doing things and left them to their own devices. And we know that Jesus is going to return and put that all right. But that's where we find ourselves today, in a place of no compassion from the people of, people of the world, of mankind. So um, let's go to John chapter um, 14. Just, um, just to finish up there. I'm only going to use six minutes of my, of my ten. <laughs> Don't like to think too much. But I just, um, what, what we see from, from day one is God's spirit was, was always there. God's spirit was always um, available um, to come in and make a difference in the, in the lives of his people. He was always there. And what Jesus is talking about here is um, a slight shift in, um, in the story, a slight shift in the dynamic of how everything worked. Um, and we're very familiar, familiar with the scriptures. We can't say them, but we're familiar with them. <laughs> Verse 15 of John chapter 14. Um, Jesus here, and he's saying to his disciples, before they, the Holy Spirit came, this is, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because it's the same thing. The prophets came, they, told, they gave direction. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, you may abide, that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. And it's a really key thing that, that um, it was a comforter, it was a, a remedy, it was a, a cure, but he says but he was with you, and he's talking about the future, and he said and he shall be in you. Um, and that's what he's talking about, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you shall see me, because I live, you shall live also. And at that day you shall know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he that has my commandments and keep them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. And it's just a great promise, and, and it goes from God being, um, losing his patience really with mankind for their disobedience and their refusal to hear him, to saying, I've now got a remedy, um, it's a comforter, it's the, the compassion once more, and, and he's opening the door again 
And I suppose the message we want to take out to the people today is there is a reason things are the way they are, but there's also a solution to it. There is a remedy. Um, and, and we want to tell you more about it. And six minutes. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry now because it was a thanks, buddy. <laughs>